Hello, and welcome to Brooklyn and Rails Common Ground. I'm Micah Green, an, an events assistant here at The Rail, and I have the pleasure and privilege of being your MC today for the seventh installment of Publishing in Transit today with Belladonna, an experimental feminist in pu publishing and literary organization. We have uh, Marcella Durant, Tanya M. Foster, and Zoe Tuck in conversation with the creator of this series, Cole Swenson. A few notes before we get started. Um, we've started all of our events with two important acknowledgements. First is that here in New York, we are in we are on Lenape Hoking, the unsuited lands and waters of the Winnipeg mm, Wappinger, Karnarsi, Monsi, and Lena Lenape people of the Delaware Nation and Shinnecock Indian Nation. Part and parcel of this acknowledgement is the continued recognition that Black Lives Matter and that when it comes to our liberation, our histories never unfold in isolation. Secondly, over the past 21 years, the Brooklyn Whale has undertaken a miraculous journey, bringing together in a single monthly publication, art, music, dance, film, theater, and literature, along with thoughtful social and political meditations. As a small profit, we need your support. This December, we are fundraising $150,000 in 31 days. Your contribution will directly support our writers, guest artists, production staff, and operations at the rail for the coming year. Please check the chat for more info and links. Uh, that'll be coming up soon. Um, but before then, uh, it is my honor to introduce today's guests and hosts. Um, we have Marcella Durand, who is a writer um, whose most recent books include The Prospect, which is just now out with, uh, from Delete Press and Earth's Horizons, which is her translation of Michelle Mitai's um, book-length poem, Les Horizons du Sol, published this spring by Black Square Editions. She's currently working on a new collection forthcoming from Black Square Editions as well. Writer and scholar Tanya N. Foster is the author of A Swarm of Bees in High Court and the bilingual chapbook, La Grammaire des Eaux, um, the chapbook, uh, History of the Bitch, and co-writer of The Third Mind, Creative Writing Through Visual Art. The 2020 to 2021 Lisa Goldberg Fellow at the Radcliffe Institute at, of Harvard University, Tanya holds the George and Judy Marcus Endowed Chair in Poetry at San Francisco State University. She was raised in New Orleans, and her family goes back generations um, in Louisiana. Poet Zoe Tuck was born in Texas, became a person uh, in California, and now lives in Northampton, Massachusetts, where she is building the Threshold Academy, a future bookstore and non-traditional educational and performance space. She co-creates the But Also House reading series, um, co-edits Hot Pink Magazine, and write and works at Belladonna Collaborative and Tripwire Journal. Zoe is the author of Soft Investigations from Daisy Mayhem Books and Terra Matrix from Timeless Infinite Life. And keeping them in conversation and questions is poet Cole Swenson, um, who is the author of 17 volumes of poetry and one collection of critical essays, Noise That Stays Noise, and a book of hybrid poem essays titled Art in Time, uh, which came out with Nightbook, um, Nightboat just last month. A former Guggenheim Fellow, she's been a finalist for the National Book Award and received the Iowa Poetry Prize and the National Poetry Series Prize, among others. She has translated over 20 volumes of poetry, prose, and art criticism from French, and here she is to translate the secrets of the publishing industry for us. Cole, take it away. Thank you so much, Micah. And thank you everyone at the Brooklyn Rail for supporting this series and for giving us the space to just talk, exchange ideas, uh, and raise some new ones, we hope. So let's just start by getting everyone's voice into the room uh, so we know who's here, and what they sound like. Uh, and I'm going to invite you simply to tell us where you are, what you're seeing out the window, what the weather's doing, just to remind us that though we're in virtual space here, we're also all in very real spaces. So maybe I'll start with Marcella. 
Unmute yourself and tell us where you are. Um, <laughs> that's a pretty emotional question for me right now. I'm in the Lower East Side where uh, probably a lot of people on this call know that East River Park is being destroyed. And unfortunately that's um, what I'm seeing outside my window today, but um, I'm keeping it together and trying to learn lessons and move on for fighting for parks and public spaces and um, better climate change projects. So watch out in your neighborhood for climate change resiliency projects. Thank you for today. I'm looking forward to the discussion. Thanks, Marcella. Tanya, you're, you're muted. I am in Oakland, California. You might even call it West Oakland, although it's it's more lower bottoms, Prescott. I'm looking out of my window at the lot next to the house I'm in, uh, which is a new build. And next to that house, I'm looking at the side of a house um, that's been here a long time. Um, I am thinking about bell hooks and thinking about her, um, her life, her life, Greg Tate, but also her feminism is for everyone, her insistence on uh, the lived density of Black women's lives, of recognizing it, of celebrating it, and, and giving clues into how to live in the fullness of that in a place that may actually hate your existence. Um, how to love anyway. Thank you. Thanks for that. And Zoe. Hi, yes. Um, my name is Zoe Tuck. Uh, and I'm in Northampton, uh, Massachusetts, um, which is the uh, unceded land of the uh, Nonotuck people and it was historically referred to and, and uh, you could still refer to it as Nonotuck or Norwatuck. Um, and there's nothing that <laughs> interesting outside my window right now. Uh, before I get to the window, I keep glancing over at my elderly Chihuahua to make sure she hasn't fallen off the couch. <laughs> so that's my immediate view. Um, but yeah, I'm so I'm so grateful to be here with all of you. Thanks, great. And Micah. What are you seeing out there? Yes, I see um, uh, an unseasonally warm December day um, in Virginia. I am back home in Richmond for the holidays. So, yeah. Great. Good. Well, great to have all your voices here and great to be focusing on Belladonna, which is just such an amazing project and covers so many different aspects, so many different dimensions. So I thought it would be great to start simply by hearing from the three of you about the specific projects that you've been working on or have worked on with Belladonna in the past. And so let's just start with Zoe on that and let us know what you're doing. Yeah, thank you. Um, I'm a pretty recent uh, addition to Belladonna. Um, I started, uh, I guess I was sort of invited in by Samuel Ace, um, some of whose like early books were getting republished. Um, and then I just sort of found it warm and welcoming and stayed. <laughs> um, and I, I, I do the newsletter, but I've also been um, co-curating the reading series, uh, which traditionally and still comes with the publication of a short chaplet um, for each of the readers. Um, so that's, that's basically my, my role. How, how's the reading series adapted to the COVID situation? Have you been able to keep up? Well, uh, it's on. It's just on Zoom right now. Um, so, yes, in that sense. Um, I mean, I think I. I don't want to speak for anybody else, but I definitely have been feeling, and I'm still feeling that longing for the sort of embodied uh, co-presence of of a reading. Um, 
you know, a reading in person. Um, but I think, you know, I, we, we can hum along pretty happily in Zoom. And I, I, I don't know, this feels like a warm space. It feels like people are learning how to make a warm uh, and present space, um, despite the pernicious blue glow. <laughs> so, yeah. Great. Marcella, would you tell us about the dimensions that you occupy in relation to Belladonna? Um, I have experienced a full spectrum with Belladonna, which has been wonderful. Um, I was the first reader with Akila Oliver back in 1999 at Blue Stockings Bookstore, um, which was an amazing experience. Um, I think of Akila actually as just an ever-present guiding um, person and principal and soul in, in Belladonna um, and think of her often. Um, and since then, I've, I've gone through a gamut of things. I've, um, I had a book published with Belladonna area. I have helped publish other books. Um, I have kind of gone in and out of involvement, which is the nice thing about Belladonna is that you can always be involved, even if at the moment you aren't involved, actively involved. And currently I'm working with Jennifer Firestone on a um, collection of pieces on avant-garde feminist uh, po literary poetics. And um, so we've been gathering that collection together and, and Belladonna will be an important part of that collection. So that's the most current project. So yeah, it, it's, it's definitely um, been a major part of my life, <laughs> poetics, everything, everything. Great, thanks. And, and Tanya. You know, um, I had one line of answering this question, and I, I think I, listening, I've, I've shifted, and with Bell Hooks passing, my, my line of response has shifted, but I'm thinking about the relationship between the personal and professional. And Belladonna has been, and Belladonna writers, Marcella is one of my oldest friends. Rachel is a dear friend. Akila was a dear friend. Um, there's a way that I had a book published with Belladonna, a swarm of bees at High Court. Um, I have, I had a chaplet. I also remember reading at some point in Blue Stockings and reading at the Zinc Bar and different spaces with Belladonna. Um, I was a part of the organizing committee for the Ad Fempo conference that was at um, that was at the Grad Center CUNY. Um, and when I was incredibly ill. Um, Belladonna, the Belladonna crew. I almost said Belladonna army, but I think there's more of a culture of care than a culture of war. Um, and so the Belladonna crew sort of gathered uh, support around me. Um, and it's really, Belladonna has been a space where I've I don't know, come to understand the sense that um, art doesn't happen without community. Poetry doesn't happen without community. And Belladonna has been working to foster a sense of community in a kind of material life um, and the aesthetic life, a community of uh, diverse voices, um, diverse aesthetics, um, yeah. Great. Thank you all for that. I think we can all want to hear a lot more about each of these aspects. I feel like we've touched on uh, the great range and I'd love to hear some of the detail uh, about each of these projects and how they all dovetail together. It seems that community is one of the key gelling agents here. It's the one thing, it's kind of the grout that brings all of these different pieces together and keeps them in place. Uh, and I'd love to hear, and maybe I'll just 
start with you, Marcella, uh, about how you see community operating and how it relates to literary citizenship and how that might play out with Belladonna. Well, um, Tanya brought up um, when we had a kind of pre-check meeting, um, Material Lives, which was a moment in which Belladonna really looked hard and looked practically at the material lives of writers. Um, and we, we just have realized on so many levels about how the material life affects the writing um, and that working as it, um, experimentally as we do, do pressing against activism and in, in language and being um, that many of us have um, a lot of gaps in our, say our healthcare coverage and, and work as, as women um, and women identified, it's just, you know, we still live in an actively hostile culture to much of what we do. So that mean material lives was just so amazing and something that I think still reverberates um, today where we just gathered healthcare resources um, like a list and we were distributing it to people. And when, it, when a writer is ill or in need that we get together and um, participate in the, the fundraising or, or whatever. And that kind of um, alternate network is just so essential on the kind of shadow network underneath the official canon network of support um, that kind of cross ties with people. So um, more currently the project I'm working on the collection, it comes out of a, a class that Jennifer Firestone was teaching at the new school um, on avant-garde feminist poetics. And I was a fellow for that class. And we realized also how completely lacking the scholarship is and that so many of the writers today have not had a chance to con establish their own context publicly that you know we have who we're influenced with by and interested in it's and we have not been able to have that in the form that we're able to share with each other to be appreciated and and we found that the students just reacted so much more fully when we we're able to show what writers are operating we, we don't operate in a vacuum but our lineage is absolutely not at all it is like the traditional lineage. Um, we have a very independent lineage, exciting lineage, you know, we pick and choose what we're interested in. It's active and exciting. Um, so in this class that each visiting writer would provide an influence packet and it was so exciting to see what say Latasha and Diggs was looking at or Erica Hunt or and and just what they're reading and we realized what a powerful thing this was and um, to erase that silence, erase silence, how do you erase silence? Um, <laughs> that's sort of an oxymoron. So yeah, so we've been, we've been um, really working with, as, uh, Jen is here, I see her, my co-editor, hello Jen, who has been working so hard too, amazing part of Belladonna. It's just such a vibrant community. I mean, it's just, um, amazing to have these lights ongoing and I think even through these difficult times it's um you know our I hate to even call them successes because I hate that word but um just to have what we're doing ongoing together is, is so amazing so great it's great to have these concrete examples of what actually goes on in the world and I was thinking, Zoe, that a newsletter is a fundamental way of keeping people in touch with activities and with what's going on. Could you talk about how the newsletter concretely aids with community or uh, is active with it? Um, sure, yeah. <laughs> uh, but I, I also realized something that I didn't say in my little spiel about what I'm up to, which is that uh, there's also uh, a Belladonna school. I forget what we're calling it. Maybe uh, so someone can chime in the, the Belladonna School of Feminist Practice and Poetics, uh, which has now had two classes. Um, so that's, that's, another, that's another form that feels like of, of, of what uh, Marcella was talking about, of like creating your own context. And then I think it also leads back 
to, you know, what Tanya was talking about in terms of like material life. I mean, literally like making a, making a community, making a, a space for transmission, education, but also for, uh, to sort of augment <laughs> the livelihoods of living poets. Um, anyway, but yeah, the newsletter, uh, I'm trying to think, I don't know. I mean, um, I, uh, one of the things that I think it does, I mean, like when I, when readers read for uh, Belladonna, I think of them as being part of this. I mean, it seems like they are part of this like growing mycelial network. So I think part of it's that is that is that I'm just checking in with everybody and then I'm also Googling everyone and the network kind of keeps growing and proliferating. Um, so it's a it's a it feels like a nice way to to reflect and extend that and also to acknowledge that that's happening like you you've been invited in. <laughs> um and you're still in you know I think of all those people as like I guess I've never really talked about it with anyone but my working assumption is having been invited in everyone's still in and the room just keeps getting bigger um and everything that everyone else is doing you know it's not just like we're privileging oh this is their this is their belladonna publication and that that's all we can see but you know uh this is a person we've invited in uh, to our community who's invited us in and these are all the things that they're up to that's my ideal of it anyway yeah so the newsletter actually so getting concrete again actually gives information about various people involved in the collective and what their activities are I I try I try to yeah I try to and to also pitch out what's happening in terms I mean I feel like last year especially in terms of uh activism I was just sort of like what can I slip in <laughs> what sort of uh what sort of anti-authoritarian protesting can I advocate for no no one seems to mind people seem to encourage it okay <laughs> you know so and inviting people to gather in places yeah really yeah I mean like Marcella was mentioning you know and uh, uh you know people have been sounding the alarm within our network for like East River Park so yeah yeah, yeah. it's just the 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 latest instance. Yeah, yeah. And and Tanya, you brought up community immediately, and with the support network that you found when you needed it. Um, how and what other ways do you see it happening as well? Well, it's something. I, I mean, one of the things I'm thinking of is it. It's not just that I found them it's that they also found me that i have been a slow writer or a secret poet in a lot of ways so i'm writing in the margins and belladonna kept insisting that in fact this was work and there was a public space for it and when i say belladonna specific people rachel where's your book we've got to get this book out um, Marcella and, and others within Belladonna. So there's that. But I brought up community in part because there's the myth of the writer, right? Being this kind of isolated figure. And while there is the work that the writer does alone, we do it with an idea of a we always existing and insisting on its presence. And that in fact, I only exist in proximity to you. Um, and so there's some way that Belladonna insists on um, one, the kind of listening, reading ears uh, for a lot of people. And there's a sense of, um, there's also such a sense of, um, what am I thinking of here? A sense of there being space for um, even talking about the ways that our aesthetic choices are driven by our material conditions. The kind of poems one writes if you have infinite time and don't have to work 
for jobs may be very different from the kind of poems one writes when you're writing in the margins of time. And what's the space for that work in the world? And I feel like Belladonna has been um, interesting in making community, drawing together the kinds of writers who aren't necessarily without the space that community, um, without the space that Belladonna makes for community, that they, they aren't necessarily in community, in conversation with each other, but that the press itself makes that community, the reading series makes that community. There was a time when there were meetings around, um, as Marcella pointed out, of uh, material lives, what people needed, how to get health insurance or checked gynecological help or whatever, if you didn't have the cash or the job for it. Um, yeah, I mean, I don't know I, if that answers your question, but that's what I've been thinking a lot about and how to, um, I think we, we have, there's a dated image of the intellectual and scholar that's very gendered and very raced. Um, and it is the person who has someone to feed them, to take care of things while they're busy living the life of the mind. And then there are the writers who get up at five o'clock in the morning before the kids get up. The writers who write when they, they have to run off when they're ironing clothes <laughs> or write on the subway on the way to work. Um, and so the, the length of the poem is the length of that, you know, ride to work and the rhythm of the train or any number of things. And so Belladonna has a, a space for those, makes space for those very diverse um, conditions of production. Thanks, great. It, it is a, a question that has no answer but community itself. And, and I think the three of you just touched on really wonderful different aspects of that and that there are more aspects to touch on as well. I was also thinking about history and how does something like such an intricate network come about? What's, what's the germ that gets it going? And I know that Rachel is here with us today. And I wonder if Rachel might just tell us a little bit about the very first moment, what gave rise to the whole idea just to put you on the spot. Hi, thank you so much, Cole, and everybody for this. It's, it's really fun to be here. <laughs> thank you. I know it took a lot of work to put it together. Um, and um, and that, thanks, Malvika, as well, for putting it together and for insisting that we do this. Um, so I, have a, I was a feminist, and then I was a poet, and I, then I was an avant-garde poet, and my poetics, the, the feminists that were doing work that was in my poetic zone, my aesthetic zone, and other feminists, radical feminists that I was doing organizing with were not the same, fem they were not publishing in the same venues. So I wanted to bring together these two things. One thing I found was that, um, that, that the avant-garde zones were really male dominated. They were just, you know, publishing and people would say things like, some of our best poets are women. <laughs> and so, but the minute I did it, the, the second it happened almost, people recognized it and participated in it. And um, uh, at Maureen Owen's reading, probably in 2001, um, Erica Kaufman came and joined and just grew things and people just always hung around and I wanted to close it in 2009, because I was overwhelmed when Erica went and got a PhD and everybody just became collaborative. They, it, it turned over. And I think it, I think what Zoe is saying about, what's, uh, about the sort of the collection of people that doesn't ever get abandoned is what 
mean, sustains it. Our our structure is is loosey loose, and it can feel chaotic and um, precarious. But there's always um, this uh, all this other stuff that's holding it up. So I don't know if that answers the question. Thank you for answering. No, no it it does. And obviously, the history is is the people, and it sounds like it has always had an extremely organic growth, uh, word of mouth and reaching out that's really important. Uh, I know that you also do workshops and some other community outreach things. Uh, and I'll bet people would love to hear the details of those projects as well. Um, can I get someone to comment on them? I, I'll just say quickly, and then I think Zoe should say something because I think Zoe's doing a workshop. But it, it's once again, it's it's the kind of thing where um, since we don't have a, I mean, Jane, James is an incredible um, uh, project manager. I'm not really sure what James's title is even, but we have just a part time um, person and a studio to maintain, and so there's a lot of work, and there's really no workers except for James who's doing all this other stuff. Um, so when there's an idea like a, let's have workshops or let's do a school, there it has to be initiated by the person that wants to do it, um, and which is great. So I really wanted to um, Serena Chopra to teach me about um, feminist mythology. <laughs> so I made a workshop with her and it was amazing. And then we started Belladonna School because because people wanted to work with her and she said yes to it. And we found a way to pay her through tuition and um, voila. Great, thanks. Zoe. Yeah, I, yeah, I think I can just jump in and, and, and speak to what I'm up to. I'm uh, actually later today, we're having the, the final session of a short class called uh, Ecriture Trans Feminine. <laughs> um, which sort of ties together a couple of threads that I'm thinking about, because uh, I noticed, I mean, the reason why I felt comfortable to pitch it, I think, was because of the nature of um, Serena's workshop, which I wasn't able to participate in, but the, the very idea of it, the title of it was, uh, I think, Rampage, Wound, and Chthonic Desire. Um, and I was like, oh, this is, this is also my beat. Um, and... Uh, you know, I think that I'm I'm very much interested in that intersection of like feminism, poetics, mythology, uh, and I wanted to see how I could enter translate into the conversation. Um, and I noticed uh, Evelyn Riley in the comments mentioned how to and however. <laughs> and so uh, just to, to, to bring it back to those, uh, to those journals, I know that one, one or the other of them, maybe both published a mentor of mine, uh, Laura Moriarty, um, who, you know, we were talking a little bit about our history, uh, our individual histories with Belladonna, but I'm also thinking about like my prehistory with Belladonna, which is just as a reader. Uh, and um, Laura ran a reading group to read some work by Carrie Edwards, um, who's, you know, some of whose work and work about her work was co-published by Belladonna. <laughs> um, and so I think, why am I bringing this up? I guess I'm bringing this up because it, it feels like, uh, and because of the, you know, I feel, uh, invited in as a woman, as a feminist, as a trans woman, and, and also invited to make further room. Um, I think that's what I, I'm also trying to do with the class is to say, here's the room I have. Now let's widen, the, let's keep widening. Uh, so I don't know, I'm excited. I mean, I'm, now I'm just like pitching it to the room. I'm like, you have a good idea for a workshop. <laughs> That, that fits under the rubric of feminist practice and poetics, uh, please send it our way, uh, pitch it. Great. Um, I'm, I'm sure everyone here is thinking and has an idea. So that may be a growing, a growing issue too. Um, I don't know if James is with us today, uh, but if so, uh, 
there'd be great room for you to say a word here. So we'll just leave that as an open invitation. Um, so I'm thinking about outreach. I'm thinking about a conversation that we had um, a little bit in our uh, pre-organizational meeting. And Tanya, you had some really interesting things to say about volunteering and the kind of social construction of the volunteer. Well, I often think of who, who can afford to volunteer, right? That, um, yeah. that there are ways that we don't talk. I, well, there is some talk about it because we talk about internships, who can afford to take internships, but it requires um, time that isn't monetized. <laughs> so you kind of have to have enough money to be able to set aside this time to do something for which you are not paid. Um, and so no matter how much you love something, there are still limits to what, I mean, what I've learned is there are physical limits to what you can do in terms of your time. Um, and so I think what's been interesting and important about Belladonna is over time that people have been able to be more present or give more in terms of their time and other times less. Um, yeah and still feel a part of the community. Yeah, I think that issue about uh, volunteering and so much of poetry of a certain stripe uh, in this country is based on volunteerism. And so the, the kind of networking that is essentially a handing off when I'm, when I no longer have time, you know, handing it off to someone who does and the way in which that reinforces and being able to say, I have no more time, reinforces the network by passing it on to someone else. Well, and my concern about the network is that there are those people who do not have the material resources to give away their time. Yeah. Yeah. Right? Um, if you have to work for jobs, yep. you have to work for jobs. And so there are certain structures that are reinforced. Um, and I wonder if there are ways, like I like that there's in the chat ideas of supporting memberships and subscriptions. And my question becomes, who are the people we can support to give of their time? Um, and that sometimes we can amplify an idea of diversity of voices and, and aesthetics by it's uh, in the system we're in, it seems most possible through financial support. Yeah. Yeah. yeah it, I'm thinking about the complexity of Belladonna, which I, as I understand it, has been mostly volunteer. So how can a kind of micro volunteerism, giving that five minutes that you may have free, it seems like Belladonna has figured out a way. That's to interesting. Yeah, that's I, really interesting. I'm sorry to interrupt. I'm no. thinking. I'm thinking about it, and so I'm. Uh, I have poor impulse control. That's not true. I was gonna, I don't have that. That is so control. not true. <laughs> <laughs> I know. Um, I, Tanya and I have talked a lot about imagination and being to imagine ways out of the system. And I, I, think, I think we've had a lot of discussions about how to be an ethical organization within a larger, extremely unethical system. And it's, it's not easy. And we need to share and constantly imagine ways to make Belladonna happen, especially the logistics without exploitation extraction. And it's, it's not easy. I mean, just to be the structure of a nonprofit 
you have to fit into a certain structure in order to get the legal definition of a nonprofit. Um, and I think that kind of imagination requires communal collaborative talk um, that by the, these discussions and constant imagining about ways to not be like this is essential. Um, and that, that's been a, a great part of Belladonna for me is just to keep thinking of alternate structures that don't um, require that sort of um, unmonetized labor and extraction and unrecognition. And, and that there's a way to do this that is enriching to the people participating too, that they, they're not seen as like, you know, send all these books out, but um, let's try to think of a way to send out these books that will bring you some something to your bank account or your poetry or your community or well-being. So I mean, that's really beautifully said. It's it's funny. I mean, think of and often with friends, I talk about poetry as an extra market value, right? That somehow if we're doing it right, <laughs> it, it, um, it, it, it ascends, no, not ascends, but it is a kind of extra market value so that it cannot be monetized. And yet the truth is in order to, to write what one wants to write, which may somehow not have a marketplace for it or write what one needs to write because something is calling itself into existence, that um, it's better to not be starving or unhoused or ill. Um, and so how do we, it seems so much of what you describe um, is that, um, real need for us to make a more just society, even as we make it on a micro level. And that requ requires a kind of flexibility. Um, yeah. And I don't know, reinvention of the terms of value. I was thinking, um, um, that idea of the nonprofit. What a weird thing to call an organization that is working for the betterment of culture or the betterment of health, or why are nonprofits necessarily defined against this profit making? So instead of, oh, we're a pro culture organization, uh, or it, it seems like, again, language embeds the very problem and makes it more difficult to address. That is so true. And I, you know, just with the Cease River Park thing, I was thinking of this writing exercise of trying to express what the trees meant in ways that were not extractive terminology, like treasure, value, you know, invaluable. It's like, yeah, just the very words are problematic. Um, but, you know, I just also wanted to add one, thing about Belladonna too that I think is a way of stepping out of these paradigms is, is that it's a very active editor, editorship. And I think Rachel has really pioneered this where that kind of ongoing lifetime active editorship is a way of kind of subverting this ready-made, like here's this perfect manuscript I did on my very own that I'm submitting to this contest for a fee and then maybe you'll publish it if it's perfect enough. Instead, it's like a collaborative hands-on um, working with writers and thinkers through this span of their involvement of Belladonna to really see what kind of work can be brought out and, and shared to the world, which I think is a, at this point, a pretty subversive alternative to what the literary world is. I mean, this, I, don't, I can't think of many publishers who really follow writers as people from their material lives onward to um, 
create that kind of work that the writer could create if they're actively supported in in their aesthetic and material lives. So, yeah, I was um, that idea of the unfinished, and I was reading, read a great quote somewhere. I'm jet lagged, so I don't remember where it was, but something about uh, you know the writing that is finished has died. You know that idea that the the perfect is not what we're after. We're after something that is still reaching toward something. Um, and that takes me back to thinking about workshops and kind of, I'm thinking about activism also, because I know that, that Belladonna has overflowed uh, into a lot of different activist moments, but uh, how is the workshop activism? Uh, how is, um, the newsletter activism. I'd, I'd love to hear your thoughts about how various aspects of Belladonna overflow into a kind of activism in itself. Can I just jump in on, on, on the Go thing ahead. Marcella was saying briefly? Um, in a way, just to add also what you're saying, Cole, which is like the event as activism too, right? That in this, in this event that you're at, something changes for you, for you, in the event because of what Tanya Foster has just said or what Marcella Durand has just said or what Zoe Tuck has just said. And they are, as they are in their lives or they, you know, as women don't insert themselves in the way that an unfinished producer who, you know, has a different ego, ego formation in the culture, my, et cetera, right? There's all these ways that we are recognizing each other as transforming us and these are, producers of transformations that keep on producing transformations and they don't have books, right? Because of their lives, just to speaking to what Tanya was saying. And so there, that as well, um, uh, right, to recognize, to, to, to recognize the event as, as production of literary texts in and of itself. Yeah, excellent point. Yeah, anybody want to leap in and, and talk about your own experience of that phenomenon? Well, Rachel um, looked at my book area and really edited it in a way that I think I, is people do not edit. It was a conversation, it was an intensity, and um, I think also shaped how I approach manuscript formation. <laughs> Blowing a kiss <laughs> in my, going forward. My so husband I think going through the dinner. <laughs> material lives. Material <laughs> well, lives. Part, part of the Belladonna. Yes. Absolutely. Thank you, sweetie. <laughs> Excuse me. Um, we, I mean, uh, I think sometimes people like, like I was just thinking, I went to Adam Pendleton's um, installation. Uh, phenomenon at, at the MoMA. And I've seen Adam Pendleton's work on pages and it, of course uh, it can't, I thought, oh, I need to go to this, this immersive thing because so th there's, there's, for people who do like Julie, um, Julie Patton is a person who uh, like, like the event and the art and the texts are happening in very much in relationship to the community, to working with children, to make, to saving the forest and because it's so alive, to, to, to refer to your quote, Cole, it's really actually hard to represent in a text. And so yeah. that's also a part of the editing is how do we, so Selena Sue's book was so alive and so visual and activist and poetic. And how do you, how do you actually get all those pieces and represent, so maybe you have to bring in the right design, the right design, you have to have a conversation about design that as Marcella said, would not necessarily be initiated before the, manuscript was accepted normally in a in a more capitalist press. I think well, that's I think the, I, I was just gonna say and I, I think that idea of the text as a dynamic moment, right? Dynamic space that is as you point out, Cole, is not dead because it's not perfected. But it's the possibility it's one possibility and one iteration 
of many possible iterations. So that, um, I mean, I think of all the, I, we could go to uh, Walt Whitman for some reason, uh, <laughs> but the revision, the revisiting of the text and the rewriting of the text. We could go to Kamal Brathwaite, we could go to Norbessi Philip and Zong in the myriad iterations of the performance of the text. But that possibility of thinking of the text as not thingifying it, right? Which is ultimately the commodification and the killing of it. But to allow it to be this dynamic possibility in this space of potential. Reality. And one thing that's set down that one can come back to. I mean, I know in terms of my own work, I would spread pages on the floor or and pieces of what ultimately became a long poem on the floor to look at um, and see it in that way. And there was some way that um, I still find myself writing in the margins a swarm of bees in high court, these other possible interventions into the text. So, yeah. So it's still living. And as one therapist said, your issues are always your issues. So if you recognize that your book is one manifestation of a series of issues, you'll come back to it in one way or another. That's so depressing. <laughs> <laughs> I think there's something coming. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Can I, can I jump on that, Tanya? Yes. Um, yeah, I feel like what you were saying about the thingification of the book can also be, I, I hope I'm not overextending extending this, but I feel like the thingification of the book can also mean the thingification of the author. Um, mm -hmm. And I feel like it should, it should definitely be said uh, at some point in this conversation, I, I've been thinking so much as we've been talking about like the elders series, um, both as the literal series within, within Belladonna publications, but also just, uh, the, the, you know, the working with, uh, longitudinally across, across times, across times of life, uh, feels like such a central part of, of, uh, of Belladonna's anti-thingification practice, <laughs> I guess, because when you, when you get to be a poet or when you get to be a whole life and when you're in conversation with a whole life, um, I don't know. Yeah, that, that feels like, uh, yeah, you get to have those other things, those human things kinship and not not thingification i don't know i just felt like i should throw it in there yeah yeah i'm glad you brought up the elder series because i i do feel that's also something that's a rare is that this cross generally cross um generational conversation that i i have found it at belladonna that i really value this chance to talk to uh those ahead of me on the path and those behind me on the path and those with me on the path and that it's really is a timeless space in that way i mean in a way it's like this i wish ageless space but sort of ageless um, i think right <laughs> can i ask about the concrete details about the elder series is it a reading series a publication series how do you contact the people involved do they contact you should I jump in on this? Thanks. <laughs> um, when we were at, at 10 years and I thought we were going to close, we did a, we, that's when we did at FEMPO, which is Advancing Feminism and, and, and pra Practice. Um, uh, we add FEMPO, Advancing fe Feminist Avant Garde Practice or not. Um, it's, it's for something. Um, that uh, we also did this, we did an eight part one book a month series where we invited 
uh, poets to in, to work with their uh, elders or people that had inspired them. And, um, and we did, and so the books that had, there were eight books, all per bound, one per reading, and they had work from each person and a conversation of some sort in the book as well. So, and so some of them have three authors and some of them have two authors. And we haven't done it again, but there is a kind of theme, I think, and other people can, maybe Zoe can talk to this. There is a, that, that theme actually sort of merged into the, the, um, the germinal text series, which sort of acknowledges that we now have a lineage of feminist avant-garde practice. And so those books are often uh, books that have, we've been working with for a long time. The Theory of Sunday was the first one. Gail Scott, who had been involved for a long time, said, we published this book in 1988 in French. Let's, let's translate it for, it came out in 2013. It was a very interesting moment to rethink or relook at uh, feminism from Montreal in, in 2000 and in, in um, 1988. And so, and then we was it Samuel Ace, of course, is an elder, and their books um, came out as an elder series. And Lynn Higinian republished uh, six of the positions of the sun and the full manuscript as an elder series. So, as a, as, as a germinal. So, maybe elder series has become germinal texts, and those are about the long story that Marcel is talking about. I think, I think that that's right. Zoe, do you want to add to that and flesh it out a little more even? Sure, yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm just thinking about Sam's work because he's a friend. Um, and I'm just thinking about that ability to, I mean, because what it is is sort of a, a, a re-presentation of early books written as a, you know, as another gender, <laughs> as another sexuality. Um, but just, I don't know, it feels, it, to me, in my own limited reading, it feels rare that writers have the opportunity to swerve around and maintain, uh, you know, and be, be able to present work otherwise, except as new work. Um, and I don't know, you, you need the right container. You need a safe container, I guess, to make something. So my, my partner's a therapist that I'm surrounded by therapists. So I'm, I think a lot about safe containers, um, uh, you know, to, to, to represent yourself. And to, that, that takes an awful lot of, of sensitivity, I think, um, and nuance, um, I think, to be, to be able to engage with your own like textual and personal history in that way. I, I don't know if that's making any sense. Yeah. Um, I think this this isn't literally part of the of the germinal text series or the or the uh, elder series, but I, uh, I I wanted to shout out a special moment for me, which is when Ra uh, Rachel invited me in to do an introduction uh, for a reading of uh, Minnie Bruce Pratt. Uh, why am why am I bringing this up? <laughs> why am I bringing this up? Maybe I'm just bringing it up to shout it out. Shout out! It was a great moment. Uh, yeah, yeah, and also yes, yeah. Kay Gabriel, Eileen Miles, Cameron Awkward Rich. So you know, uh, Rachel's pointing out in the chat in terms of meet me there. Um, you you know, and also in terms of what Tanya was saying, um, it's the myth of the solitary writer is absolutely a myth. Um, and I think I think that's there when you when you make a publication a place to stage community is uh, in relation um, that that leaning against. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah. I was thinking um, that idea of taking old texts and re presenting them seems to be a reinforcement of that idea that the text is never finished, that it is, you know, it may seem to be in a book. And I, I wondered about the relationship of Belladonna print in relation to online, because it, it seems like the internet offers us a real chance for text to never be done. Uh, and not that the, the print form 
finishes them, as Tanya was saying, we can write in the margins and keep them going. Uh, but what's Belladonna's relationship between the balance of those two? I don't know if we've um, <laughs> fully invested in the online possibility, not to my knowledge. I mean, I can't really speak to it. I am wondering if Rachel would want to talk about the glass house a little bit, which has been such a beautiful vision for Bella. Oh Donna. yeah. Oh my goodness. Okay. So I will say, okay. So one thing is we, I don't, I haven't visited. We need, we need more infrastructure support. So please do donate to Belladonna so that we can get it. But we are turning all of our chaplets, which there's like close to 300 of them into PDFs online. And so they are an amazing resource. If your students, you know, you could teach a class just from using the online resources on the Belladonna website. There's, it's amazing. It's an archive of stuff that ends up being in books later on. Um, you know, the six positions of the sun end up being positions of the sun, but also there's a book by Mamie Bersenbrugge that that ends up in a really different form later on. I uh, of also of Kathleen Frazier's. You see these these little chapbooks that are uh, based on being in process. You see them in later books that come out in presses. So that's a kind of a way to teach as well. The glass house, um, I think, uh, is my idea for. Um, <laughs> I so it's a very speaking of material lives. Um, we're a feminist press, so many of us identify as women, and women um, are. At my experience of menopause was that uh, this is a time where we're like at our peak artistically and the culture is really trying to bury us and make us invisible and push us away. So the class house is about, is for me an idea about a kind of think tank of, um, of women at their peak and, at, and, and, and you know, enabling the power that is aging to be full force as a creative power together that we would have a place to have a, yeah, be seen kind of like in, you know, in a glass house as we were aging. What, what a great and liberating idea. And, and maybe that is a good segue point uh, to hear um, work, to hear everybody read for a bit and get some more poetry in the air. And so, Kind of without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to Marcella to read some of your work. Thank you so much, Cole. This has been a really, I mean, kind of personally invigorating and inspiring. I'm really glad you made this space for it. Reminds me. Well, you all made brought me back. <laughs> and thank you. So, thank you. So, um, I'm going to read a poem from this uh, PDF I did with Gloss Press called November that is sort of being reissued right now. Just, um, you can get a copy with a donation to East River Park Action, um, although they're cutting down the trees right now, so it may all be mute, but anyway, I wrote it. Uh, Tanya actually invited me into this um, daily writing um, each day during the month of November, which I, I find just a really um, interesting month and in many ways anyway, so I was happy to participate. So thank you, Tanya. Um, 11 one twenty. In this dream time or nightmare time, dream, nightmare, wake from which nightmare is gendered, mare of the night, a female spirit or monster sitting on one's head. The dreams have been pleasant lately, before and after the worry hours of 12 to 3 a.m., 3 to 5 a.m., or 5 to 7 a.m., Pleasant dreams of wolves reintroduced to East River Park or of a small warm being clasped to my side. Dream can also mean the sound of a musical instrument or of a person singing. To wake out of the sound of people singing, just an impression of dreaming, an impression of song. Um, so I'm gonna turn to my book, To Husband is to Tender. Um, it would just came out from Black Square Editions. But, you know, like, again, with the Bella Dot, I was reading sections of this. I was trying to work on it. And it was so great to have people from Belladonna show up and just encourage this. I mean, it's again, it's like this ongoing community. So from husband is to tender. 
The modern sense of female spouse began. Spouse, neuter, neutral, veiled person, see vibrate. The veil vibrates slightly with breath. The veil is still. The veil vibrates slightly with breath. The veil is still. As an object to be studied and thought around, thinking around this, what stands before me, what stands between us, stands between us, white marble figure, small with crossed arms. The veil is part of the sculpture. And that is where Susan Howe relates Plutarch's translation of an inscription, an inscription transcription on an Egyptian statue of Isis. I'm all that is and all that was and shall be, and no mortal hath lifted my veil. If the statue has been carved with the veil, the veil can never be lifted. That is how stern the patriarchy feels. We are locked like sculptures, statues, veils carved over our faces. But then the veil would be all there is of our faces. The sculptor would not have carved a face under the veil. And we have faces, we face each other. Poetry joins with art to refer to concrete situation or situation of stone, of veil being impossible to lift within the solidity of its own self, its own medium of stone. Of course, of course, the sexual reading of lifting the veil because in patriarchy, something to do with a woman usually has to do with sex. Why figurines of women are interpreted as representative of a fertility cult. When many women, men, people do not birth children, and this is sometimes out of anyone's control, children do not need to stem. Family is a so construct. If a child walks away and attaches to another, if love is replaceable, can it surely be? The network is disturbed and reattaches differently elsewhere. If the filaments are as even or as regular. Aspens across a mountain face tremble similarly. In a sense, we are and we aren't trembling similarly. Thank you again, everyone. And Tanya. Okay. Um, speaking of the poem as un undone, <laughs> um, I'll read two poems from A History of the Bitch. Um, and both are, are still being realized. First is Prologues Eden. They garden the grow in your girly giddy up. Girl, get up in here. Girl, you crazy. Girl, God don't like ugly. That's the girl right there. That's the one. These here are the limbs and lambs and I ams of languish whinnying along the streeted walls of yes, no, of he knows this and that and there because of why of what would be if we our waistlines thinned a bit, if we are wanting trim to the suit, what might be, what could be, what might have been, what could have been? Will something you simple tell flower the walls the women walk as whales they thought slip through the well-kept teeth they grind and sleep? In sleep, they garden the gotcha, garden the give and give and give until you're the fish gutted along salty shorelines, insured against inevitables. Instead of fish, be shark the waters overflowing. Sea dogs, dog or man, lavish slaving ships, sniffing blood, sniffing bodies bloodied on waves, on wages too meager, wash. Your are epidemics of anguish, nothing new. Be foul and wash over, wash over me, wash me, wash me down drown. Um, and this is uh, testimonial histories. One, 
For a time, in some places only men could testify, consider the chronic courtly test liars, testify rooted with testes, testicle routed power, tongue tied to crotch, talk of truth as biology. Biblical Abraham has his servant swear a solid, put your hand or head depending under my thigh and I will make you swear by the Lord, the God of heaven and the God of the earth. Biblical Israel, now if I have found favor in your sight, please put your hand under my thigh and deal kindly and truly with me. Oaths by issue, vocal oceans will usher each us, legislate each line, each lineage. Two, banker Stanley, husband of Rachel, testifies that he and his family have lived on Newton's Mill Street for 20 plus years, Newton's already 339, when Stanley and Rachel move there. T, 1,500 miles southwest from there, is three years old, toddling in a New Orleans shotgun on Melpamine Street. Nola, as such, is 251 years old then. 1969, year of the rooster, when Stanley and Rachel move, begin perhaps a family in that neighborhood of homes, of expansive and expensive empty lawns, the eyes yawn across. Luxuriant space in which the looking settles. T, in the tight shotgun tiny, has begun to collect language. Words roll, rumble in her tender toddler's mouth, ears forming mine. Boisterous for a young one, she is loud when she laughs, when she sings, when she searches her mama, daddy, grandma, cousins, faces, searches for the train her father tucks beneath her grandparents' front room bed for safekeeping in cramped quarters. In dreams, years later, T will recall reaching into that darkness as clearly as she recollects the kitchen stove, the unseemly window fan pulling air through, the narrow back lot, the orange sofa bed, the single bath. She will recall this darkness as tender as a fear she didn't know. 1969 in the Holocene. Like T, the Black Panther Party, miles from certain Newton luxuries, 3,085, miles from the Nolens mouth of the Mississippi, 2,263. It's just three years old. Oakland's BPP begins to feed daily little ones like T. At three, they all remap worlds, taking in words, recollate sentences meant to contain and constrain them. We remark ourselves in syllabic struts. The languages we speak, speak us into place, into roll, refuse, refuse, roll away the stones, words that hem and haw us in. Three. 1969 in the Holocene, say the FBI director says that without question, the greatest threat to the internal security of the country is the Black Panther Party. Who and what is nation in this claim? Who, what is citizen? Who, what, who does each inhabit hold? Whose internals are breached by the feeding of children as young as ones living in Southern shotguns? Who are the invasive free radicals ravaging wholeness in the thicket of the nationhood and its hooded surveillance of love expressed by filling hungry mouths? Who that surveying and saying? Years later, one who's come lately will say as she explains to him what's happened, as she weeps in her black woman uniform, as he stands in his impatient policing, calm down, stop crying, sharpening, as if her tears were insufficient testimony of what done gone down, as if her blackness were enough to let her swallow that river. 
Who can believe tears of a black woman? Who can believe tears while carrying batons and shotguns? Thank you. Wow. Great, and Zoe. Well, uh, well, y'all are tough acts to follow. <laughs> um, so this is uh, the beginning of a um, uh, manuscript that sort of grew out of the germ of I, I, I started writing poems for people who donated to the Trans Asylum Seeker Support Network. I think this might have been the first one. Um, I woke up. Britt and Patsy were there, coffee, even without cream. And I ate the rest of the chev on the salty little rice crackers that Patsy and I both love. I didn't have any work due today. I read Leora's piece and I really liked it. I had, if it's not too meta to bring it up, the idea to write poems for people if they donate to Trans Asylum Seeker Support Network, which gives me an excuse to spend time writing one-off poems, each one of which can exist within its own universe of rules, their only common denominator being my reasons and my sentiments. My therapist had me externalize sad me from the other day and talk to her. It was a little bit like time travel, I imagined that I was literally sitting across from her, glum with her elbows on her knees and her fists propping up her cheeks. And in this way, it was easier to sympathize with her as I would a friend. It was a ritual and I liked that. My friend Zach called during therapy. I called him back and we talked for an hour about going to the Madonna Inn or renting a block of rooms with a group of friends in a gay hotel in the Poconos to celebrate the end of the pandemic someday. I imagined for a second having a regular ass vulva, but I wasn't sad about it. And come like okra, nopales, a broken stalk of aloe vera. I ordered delicious sandwiches for Britt and I from a bakery in East Hampton and drove there with the window down, listening to Green Day and slapping my hand against the car, thinking about band practice on Sunday. It's good to have something to look forward to, like I might walk around later with Emily. I might go for a run. I'll probably carve out some time to write a letter to Pop, my oldest living family member, who I never came out to. So he is also the last person to call me the name I was given at birth. Um, so that's one thing. And then I thought I should read a poem that I wrote for Kimberly Alidio, uh, because, you know, it's Belladonna <laughs> Day. So, uh, you know, um, so this is called Samson's Riddle. And in incidentally, this is uh, one of those poems that was written because Kimberly, I think, donated. Um, I tried to write you the last poem of the night, but I was all tuckered out. So you get the first poem of the morning, which for mystical reasons contains an element of the abandoned poem, sliced raw red onion on pumpernickel, which by now, uh, now by virtue of its removal from context takes on an air of mystery. Do you like when the recondite flowers in the mundane? This germination daily reignites the fires of the kitchen of the world. That is the holy place where existence recapitulates itself out of pure generosity. Therefore, every ordinary kitchen like yours or mine is a face of a geometrical fantasy with innumerably many sides. What an honor. Sliced raw red onion on pumpernickel. It sounds healthy, I guess, but not especially flavorful but its aura of culinary austerity is counterbalanced by its sonic piquancy. Sliced prepares the mind with a clean sinuous line. Raw opens the maw. Red builds alliteratively upon raw's R and together the two words red and raw evoke an embodied irritation that onion undercuts Un is so short, so ordinary, so serviceable that its own mystery, the way it establishes a spatial relationship of contiguity and priority between any two things might well have been ignored. I'm always afraid I won't be understood, which spurs my propensity towards over-explaining, but as a challenge to myself and a gift for you, I leave you pumpernickel with its dark grainy pleasures unexplained. Um, and then uh, if it's okay, one more? Sure. <laughs> this is uh, called A Little Sparrow 
Um, and this is for Sophia Dahlin, uh, who I think as a great contemporary writer in the sapphic tradition. So this is a poem in the sapphic tradition. Uh, I don't know what that hand gesture is, um, but <laughs> it's my, my sapphic salute. Um, a little sparrow. The edges of your blue agony lodge less comfortably in my mommy globules than they did in the before times. Can't hear out of my left ear too well. Can't seem to motivate myself to have my eyes checked so I can buy glasses with lenses that aren't scratched all to hell. This little nudge has me thinking about inevitable death as the horizon of the sensible. Okay, grandma, let's get you to bed. Not to exaggerate, I mean, I could see the wall shrine of the Virgin Mary when Elle pointed it out to me, but sometimes when the others talked, I just smiled and nodded at intervals, attending more carefully to the words that did come through. Fragments, like the verses of Sappho we have are all the verses of Sappho we have. We have no others, unless another papyrus should come to light, etc. I told my therapist that I was lonely for God, in Decreation, Anne Carson does this lovely reading of Sappho's Fragment 31, which, after having activated the dance of jealousy, begins a marvelous turn. Quote, all is to be dared because even a person of poverty, before breaking off. Carson notes, Sappho is believed by some historians to have been not just a poet of love and a worshiper of Aphrodite on Lesbos, but also a priest of Aphrodite's cult and a teacher of her doctrines. Given this possibility, perhaps Sappho's poem wants to teach us something about the metaphysics or even the theology of love. Perhaps she is posing not the usual love song complaint, why don't you love me, but a deeper spiritual question, what is it that love dares the self to do? See a little straw poking out from the ruins of the temple to Aphrodite, and in my surmisal that it is a nest, I become a little sparrow asking, are you my mother? I, whatever I am, a bird, a woman, your human wife, approach the ruins of the temple to Aphrodite, having been a student of longing, inimical to the sanctimony of that anointed soi disant messiah, anxious to say the least, about the imperative to eat the other, proselytize, convert, felt by his followers. Ask, are you my goddess? For whom I could become an academy, lesbians with hand mirrors and papyri, just fucking anointing each other all day with knowledge, taking as our model the subterranean affiliations of the trees, the spume of the sea. Thank you. Thank you all so much. That was just so perfect to end with the work that we know remains unfinished and will be going on. Uh, we don't have time with five minutes left for a Q&A, but I, I wonder, is there a way that people can make comments on a Belladonna webpage or uh, is, is there a kind of open space there? Oh, you're, you're muted, Zoe, and I think you're saying something. I was just making a facial expression. I mean, uh, <laughs> you know, we're on social media, and you could also email us, spell it on a series at Gmail. Just, you know, make sure that the conversation continues, and, and you certainly started a, a great one here this evening. So thank you very much. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much, Cole. Thank you, everyone. Yeah. Thank you, everyone. Great to be here with you all. Yes. And someday yeah, and I just person, we'll get to do the big hug. Yeah. Yes. And I just want to reiterate. Um, thank you so much, Zoe, Marcella, Tanya, and of course Cole for bringing this all together. Um, I will be doing the Sapphic salute for now on <laughs> to end conversations. Um, so thank you again, Zoe. But we'd also like to thank Rachel and all of the wonderful folks at Belladonna for helping to make today's program possible. And everyone here today in the audience and in the chat who've been engaged with us. Um, we encourage everyone to view our archive of these conversations on our YouTube channel where we'll upload um, today's conversation shortly. And we do this every day at the rail 
Uh, so please join us again tomorrow at 1 p.m. Um, for a conversation on Elizabeth Murray, featuring art historian and writer Nancy uh, Prinsenthal, with curator Jason Andrew and artist uh, Yevgenia Baras, uh, Deborah, Deborah Cass, and Rachel Yulina Williams uh, to discuss the current exhibition at Gladstone Gallery. Um, we'll conclude with a poetry reading from Naoki uh, uh, Fuji Fujimoto. Um, and we'll just, again, uh, invite everyone um, to turn off your microphone and say goodbye as you leave. Goodbye. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. 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 Thank Hi, Zoe. Thank you. Thank you, Tanya. Ciao. Thanks for joining Thank, you. Thank you. Norma, I owe you an email. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'll send it to Tanya. All right. I'll send you an email. OK. Bye. Bye, Tanya. Bye. 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 Thank Much you all. Bye. Thank you, Micah. Bye. We'll see Bye. you later. Bye. Stay safe. Be well. Bye.